uh, the short version of this talk is up on the board there, the uh, graph uh, showing the relentless rise of the concentration of CO2 uh, in the atmosphere, uh, neatly put alongside all the COP, the Conference of the Parties uh, talks since 1994. Uh, so global emissions have continued to rise. And so when we come to what is the future of capitalism, the future of capitalism is bleak. Um, the alternative, if indeed we're to have a livable future, is breaking with market mechanisms. It's forcing governments to directly build the renewable energy and public transport we need. It's international cooperation instead of competition, ultimately for a completely different kind of system. Uh, but it won't be handed to us. We'll have to fight tooth and nail for it. I think it's clear from the genocide in Gaza that the people who own and run our world are criminals, the same people who are prepared to let Israel force you know, over one million people into catastrophic hunger uh, are the same people who are burning our planet. In both cases, it's because those who run the world are locked into international competition, uh, economically and militarily with each other. The capitalist system prevents them from cooperating. Our rulers would rather be the winners sitting on top of a pile of corpses on a burned out planet than cooperate if it means that they might lose out in that competition. And I think climate change to date has been a fairly slow moving uh, beast. You know, so long as you haven't been hit by bushfires or floods or hurricanes or live in the low lying Pacific islands, uh, your experience of climate change might have just been warmer swimming water or seasons slightly out of kilter. But <clears throat> that's changing. Um, and it's perhaps easiest to see by the graphs that have scientists particularly worried uh, at the moment, if I can just bring them up here. And so then we've got uh, the North Atlantic uh, sea temperatures this year. And for the last, you can see there is an enormous jump. Uh, things are really beginning to change. And that is happening um, everywhere. Oops, it's just hard doing this without a mouse. Uh, again, uh, Surface global surface sea temperatures, the black line at the top is 2024, the yellow line is 2023, uh, and it's the same with uh, surface air temperatures. Uh, you know, the red line, I think, is 2023. So, <clears throat> last year was the hottest on record. Uh, former NASA climate scientist James Hansen warns that the 1.5 degree safe climate limit is deader than a doornail. Uh, that two degrees by, will be there here by the late uh, 2030s. Uh, Germany's climate envoy at the COP28 summit said that the current global trajectory will lead to an unimaginable temperature rise of 2.5 to 2.9 uh, degrees C, which poses a catastrophic threat to billions of people. I mean, I should add uh, at this point, even if Hansen is right that 1.5 is dead, that we are passing abrupt climate tipping points, there never comes a point where we need to stop uh, putting carbon into the atmosphere. You know, if you don't want to end up with an atmosphere like Venus or what New Scientist magazine referred to as Thermageddon, a world that's too hot to live on, as long as we are alive, we need to keep cutting uh, carbon or keep fighting to cut carbon uh, emissions. You know, if we were able to grab control of production, uh, we could do that quite quickly. You could begin a reforestation, a uh, massive program to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. But I guess let's start with where we at, we're at. And so without any of that, the future for capitalism over the next 20 years, by 2030, six years away, sea levels will rise 20 centimetres. Uh, dwindling crop yields will plunge 100 million into extreme poverty. Climate change related illness will kill an extra 250,000 a year. By 2040, which is just 14 years away, the Arctic will be ice free in summer. Sea levels will have risen 60 centimetres. Uh, Bangladesh, Thailand and Vietnam will experience severe annual flooding that will force mass migration. By 2050, 2 billion people will experience a temperature of 60 degrees uh, for a tenth of the year. Business as usual is making our planet unlivable. And the United Nations uh, Conference of the Parties, uh, COP28, was held in Dubai in November and December last year, provided no solutions. There are records, uh, 2,456 representatives of the oil and gas industries attending, outnumbering indigenous representatives by seven to one. Uh, Sultan Al Jaba, the chair of the United Arab Emirates National Oil Company, was the president of COP28. Uh, and he was accused of uh, making, using COP28 to make oil deals on the side. 
And the problems of um, the co- co- conferences go way beyond you know, one corrupt individual. But nonetheless, it's indicative. Uh, COP has always been about the profits of the fossil fuel bosses and the, the ruling class more, more generally uh, than about real climate action. And so the deal signed by more than 200 uh, <coughs> countries at COP28 was hailed, as it always is, as historic. Um, but the reality is more greenwashing and delay. As the climate scientist Kevin Anderson put it, the time for polished rhetoric and applause is long gone. We face a climate emergency that the COP process appears simply unwilling or unable to address. And those who celebrated the deal uh, did so because it calls for the first time for transitioning away from fossil fuels, but the conference rejected calls to phase out fossil fuels uh, or any enforceable uh, transition. And worse, the agreement um, promoted abatement uh, technologies like carbon capture and storage, which, you know, 30 years ago when I was first involved in the climate movement was regarded as a fraud, it still is, to simply allow the industry to keep uh, polluting. I mean, just an example, Chevron's Gorgon Gas Hub off Western Australia runs the world's largest carbon capture storage uh, uh, project. A key test of the project process has been dogged by failure. After eight years in operation, it buried just uh, a third of the carbon dioxide it captured in the last year. It's predicted it will bury even less this year uh, because of an inability to pump away polluted water to relieve pressure. And we can't afford another eight years of failure when renewables work now. And at the conference, Labor's uh, climate change and energy minister, Chris Bowen, lied about keeping 1.5 degrees alive. Uh, he also lied, uh, saying to, the, to the, our Pacific uh, neighbours, promising we're not going to see our brothers and sisters inundated and their country swallowed by the sea. But actually, that's exactly what we will see, because Labor are currently overseeing a massive expansion of the fossil fuel industry in Australia, including projects like Santos uh, Pilega Gas Project and Woodside Scarborough. Uh, the Pacific Islanders refused to vote for the agreement at COP28, and they said they were kept out of the conference hall until it went through. When Bolivia's uh, negotiator called out the hypocrisy of the developed nations, uh, Chris Bowen replied, you know, every country has things at stake. We're a fossil fuel exporter. We've got things at stake. Um, and it's true. Uh, Australia is the third largest fossil fuel exporter in the world. Australia has no plans to stop approving new gas or coal. Uh, Bowen has said a ban on new gas or coal projects would be, quote, irresponsible. Um, since the election, the uh, government has approved three coal mine projects, approved drilling for 116 gas wells, endorsed large-scale gas extraction in Western Australia and Northern Territory, given 1.5 directly, billion directly to, get to infrastructure for gas processing and export hub uh, for the Beetaloo Basin and the Northern Territory, and has over 100 new gas and coal projects listed in development on its major uh, project list. At the end of uh, January, Resources Minister Madeleine King flew to Japan and South Korea to make it clear that the government was fully behind the expansion of uh, the gas industry. Here in New South Wales, uh, the government set to lock in more pollution through extending the life of the airing uh, country's largest coal-fired power station. And they're going to do that with between 200 and 400 million of public money uh, to, per year to keep uh, Araring uh, running and breach the government's own climate targets, which are only legislated in November. Um, it's also expro- ex- approved the expansion of the Bogabri coal mine, and Queensland's approved uh, Whitehoven Coal's Winchester South Mine, the largest uh, new coal mine plan nationwide. All of that. Uh, however, is not enough for uh, the coalition, who are hostile to any serious solar and wind increases. So coalition uh, opposition leader Peter Dutton has now thrown nuclear power into the mix. Not, I think, because he actually expects nuclear to get up. Uh, Albanese uh, is right about nuclear on cost and time. It doesn't stack up. It won't stack up. Uh, you know, the last uh, nuclear power plant built anywhere, I think it was in the UAE, took 16 years from start to, to finish. Uh, and that was being over to, without having to worry about any environmental protections. But I think what it is, it's a climate delaying tactic. It's an argument to keep Australia, the country's highest polluting coal fleet open beyond its expected life, 
Uh, while the coalition campaigns against the rollout, rollout of large scale renewable energy and promotes an alternative which is unlikely to ever arrive. Um, it also keeps the nationals officially committed to a policy of net zero by 2050 while they can continue their various uh, local campaigns against wind turbines and transmission lines which are holding up more renewable energy. I think it's also a pitch to workers in the fossil fuel industries over jobs, even if these will never materialise, that they could build nuclear power on the site of old uh, uh, coal power stations. And I think it's Labor's lack of a plan for workers in the existing fossil fuel industry that opened the door to Dutton uh, there. Similarly, Labor's failure to actually reduce emissions give Dutton some confidence he can appeal to voters more widely on nuclear, that somebody needs to do something. And it was the AUKUS nuclear subs deal which opened the door to Dutton over the issue of nuclear waste and nuclear safety. And having opened that door, uh, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese's response to uh, Dutton's nuclear push was to promise two days ago uh, $1 billion for solar panel, ma solar panel manufacturer, uh, some to be built on the site of the decommissioned coal-fired Liddell power station in New South Wales. And um, AGL and the billionaire Mike Cannon-Brooks have been roped into a feasibility study um, at Liddell. But when Albanese hints that his plan could provide regional jobs wherever coal power is um, shutting down, that comes with no guarantees at all. I mean, so at one level, a transition plan that provides jobs should be welcome, but really it's a rush thought bubble in response to Dutton. The policy comes with no details and looks like more subsidies for profit, uh, rather than the government building the panels, uh, the, let alone the wind farms and solar stations we need. And again, that sort of subsidy doesn't guarantee any kind of production. We've seen subsidies and you know, promises fall through before. When Albanese says that the government needs to be a partner, not just an observer, we need to hold him to that. To insist that such a plan come with job guarantees that the market can't deliver, um, you know, just subsidising profit is effectively being an observer to the whims of the market. And I think these kinds of rolling announcements with scant details are one way that the government uh, gives the appearance of acting on climate while at the same time overseeing an expansion of uh, fossil fuels. And so I want to run through just briefly a couple other key ways that the government uh, gets away with its greenwashing. And so the first is um, carbon accounting fraud. Um, Polly Hemming from the Australia Institute said, <clears throat> when it was deciding what year to use as a baseline for the Paris Agreement, it chose 2005 deliberately because Australia had really high emissions from land clearing in that year. And since then, ignoring some incidental drops, one-offs like COVID, Australia's emissions have only fallen by 2% to, since 2005, and that's mainly in the electricity sector. Australia hasn't decarbonised transport industry, manufacturing, waste or agriculture. Secondly, I think they get away with the greenwashing through the lie of targets without mechanisms to achieve them. So Labor has a variety of seemingly ambitious targets, but they amount to goals. So for instance, the 82% renewable energy target by 2030 is not even like the previous renewable energy target, which legally required certain energy uh, entities to buy renewable energy. It's, it's more of a goal. Um, I don't usually quote Liberal Party press releases, but when they say, Labor's 43% emissions reduction target, it's 82% renewable energy target, it's 89% electrical vehicle target, and the uh, 275 reduction in power bills are all set to fail. Uh, they are sadly telling the truth. I mean, they're using that truth to tell a lie and to keep prop, but that prop, prop up fossil fuels, but it is. Uh, renewable energy has stalled at around uh, 40%. And there, is, there are no mechanisms. There's, there's no way they're going to get it to the 82% by 2030. And then there's the overarching eye, I think, of the, the net zero goal by 2050. Uh, it doesn't actually mean zero emissions. It doesn't mean a set level of emissions reductions. It's based on the fantasy of offsets. And offsets as well are built into Labor's flagship safeguard mechanism, emissions reduction policy, that's meant to tackle emissions from coal and gas projects. The scheme is supposed to reduce emissions uh, from industrial and mining facilities by 28% by 2030, but companies can still meet offsets to meet their use offsets to meet the reduction targets. Yeah. Um, 
And that's how the government is able to say that we're going to meet uh, climate targets while continuing to dig up and export gas and coal. And research by 11 academics uh, just in the last week found that the main method used to create offsets in Australia, which is known as human-induced regeneration, uh, basically to try and promote uh, tree growth in scrubby bush, hadn't improved tree cover as promised between 2015 and 2022. The study analysed 182 projects and found forest cover had either barely grown or actually gone backwards in 80% of those projects. And it's a globally significant problem uh, because Australia's forest regeneration method is the world's fifth uh, nature-based biggest offset uh, pro program. And Meg Evans, one of the co-authors of the new study, said, what the research has found, there's nowhere near the forest cover you should see. What this means is the projects are not actually sequestering the amount of carbon claimed. You've got a whole bunch of carbon credits in the system that don't represent one tonne of CO2. Most of these credits are being used to offset heavy emitters under the safeguard mechanism. So we're not actually reducing carbon emissions at all. <coughs> the overall outcome is that we're increasing the amount of carbon pollution. Uh, <coughs> interestingly, one of the authors, co-authors of the study was Andrew McIntosh, who is a former head of the government's Emissions Reduction Assurance Committee, who now says that the growing carbon markets in offsets is a sham and a fraud on taxpayers and the environment. So I want to <coughs> start to look at uh, some of the alternative in the, in the climate movement. The Greens, um, unfortunately, backed down last year on their demand for a ban on new coal and gas, and they voted for the safeguard mechanism. Uh, this was, I think, a, a disaster for the climate movement because it sent a signal to thousands of people concerned about the climate who don't necessarily have time to look into all the, the detail that actually the government was acting uh, when it's not. Uh, that it was at least a step in the right direction when it wasn't, and it set the climate movement back when we need to be on the front foot. We can't look to the safeguard mechanisms or market or to conferences like COP28 to solve the climate move, uh, crisis. We need to rebuild the movement. It was the climate crisis, the, sorry, the climate movement that paved the way for the Gomorrah uh, shock win in the federal court uh, three weeks ago. Uh, the Gomorrah argued that the risk posed by climate change meant the project could not be considered uh, lawfully in the public interest. It was the first time a native title group had made such an argument and it reflected that uh, the Gomorrah built strong links with the climate movement uh, over many years. And major climate demonstrations in Sydney and elsewhere have championed opposition to the Pilliga project. Um, the, the original judge, Judge Dowsett, <coughs> was contemptuous of that claim, attacking the credibility of uh, expert witnesses like Professor Will Steffen and the uh, UN Internet Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But a groundswell of uh, climate activism over many years has made the issue one that courts can't simply ignore. Since 2021, there's been significant solidarity within unions. Uh, unions New South Wales took for the first time a um, position against a fossil fuel project, supporting delegations to the Pilliga and pledging actions. Uh, these networks should now demand Labor kill off Santos' uh, plan for good. Uh, meanwhile, Santos are continuing operations and likely to return to the native uh, title tribunal for a further uh, appeal that profit must uh, win out over climate. Uh, but, you know, black rights, climate and trade union movements acting together hold the power to defeat fossil fuels and win real land rights. So if we want to deal with the worst impacts of climate catastrophe, we urgently need a mass movement from below that includes workers, First Nations people, climate activists, to fight for a real and just transition to 100% renewable, publicly owned uh, energy. Climate change is a question of class, not just in who it will affect, but in who has the interest and power to make change. And workers have the potential power uh, through strike action to paralyze the entire economy and to shut off co corporate profits. Um, but it's, it's easy enough to say that. It has to be fought for politically. Um, you know, it needs to be fought for politically in workplace after workplace, in campaign meeting after campaign meeting. You know, the climate strikes uh, were the high point, I think, to date of the climate movement. We need them back. Uh, as a teacher, you know, it was always enormously frustrating that we couldn't be there uh, with the students. I think I was at one as the small delegations. I mean, the same thing with Gaza. You know, we, we should be there with the students. 
Uh, but we have to win that argument in our union. We need to rebuild the climate strikes for clear demands, for climate jobs and job guarantees, uh, for fossil fuel workers, for 100% renewable, uh, owned renewable energy, and for massively expanded public transport that is publicly um, owned. I think it's also worth saying that hope lies not just uh, in the current state of the climate movement, uh, but because uh, issues are linked and a fight or a win on any issues opens up the prospect of change um, elsewhere. So I do see that you get hope in the movement for Palestine. When I see, you know, Elbert Systems in the UK forced to sell one of their factories because of the Palestine protests, that gives hope. When I see the protests uh, in Jordan, standing up to the riot police every day, uh, calling to end the Israeli peace accords, to open the borders, that have the, the prospects, not just for Gaza, but to, to bring down their own regime and re-spark uh, revolutions of the Arab Spring. I think it does give hope. A, a movement that would have the power to end the genocide in Gaza is also one that could call the fossil fuel industry to account, is something that would have the power uh, to save the planet. So we need to fight wherever we are. I'll leave it there. <laughs>